Yes, you oh, are. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, too busy for good sake. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everybody. Hey, How are you hi. doing? Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to see all of you here. Thanks for taking the time out of your very busy schedule at this particular part of the year uh, to join us for the Student fi um, Financial Investment Fund report, which is always just a great event. Um, I know it hasn't been a very good few weeks, but I know we're in for um, a good education this afternoon. I'd especially like to thank the members of our cabinet, Interim President Workman, who's here, and Acting Provost Cole, and Vice President Williams and Vice President Rayola, who are here. Um, of course, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Michael Melton, without whom none of this would be possible. So thank you, Michael, for all the hard work that you do. And Mama Doc, is that what they call you? <laughs> Michael's lovely wife, Catherine. Uh, but most of all, I'd like to welcome back the alumni who are both here with us in the room and those of you who are joining us via video link. Uh, we're always glad to have your participation. And um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to this very talented group of our finance students. All yours, you. Janetta. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janetta Griffin, and I am the Associate Director of the Center for Advanced Financial Education's Portfolio Management Program. On behalf of myself and our director, Dr. Michael Melton, we would like to welcome you to this year's presentation of our CAFE's Student Investment Fund's performance. But before we begin, I would like the student fund um, managers to introduce themselves. I'm Joseph Beatrice. I'm Stan Pajora. I'm Matt Carano. Jason Trello. I'm Sean Tatro. I'm Adam Familietti. Amanda Leo Vizi. I'm Nick Yakima. I'm Liam Cook. And I'm Abby Klein. Now before we really get to the grit of this presentation, I would like to point out some key differences between this group of student fund managers and those of the past, like many of the alumni sitting in the audience or even watching live today. As Doc has always stressed, change is so critical for a program like this to remain current. We are always trying to incorporate new portfolio methodologies as well as trading techniques. But in addition to that, this group of student fund managers was selected to not only manage the fund for one semester, but two, during both the summer and the fall. This has proven to be quite fantastic, as you'll learn today. And as this group has had a longer holding period, they have also been able to understand many different aspects of the market with very different time periods. So, to give you a brief understanding of what this presentation is going to entail, it's going to be separated into two distinct sections. First, focusing on our CAFE growth uh, fund. With that being said, we will be highlighting the experiential learning component of our CAFE program through all the different roles of the student fund manager. First, the analyst, then the trader, and the portfolio manager. In the role of analyst, you'll learn that DOC requires us on day one to do a thorough, top-down economic analysis. Therefore, we can understand all the international and domestic mechanisms that could potentially affect our market today. Secondly, in the role of trader, you'll totally see how active management is what differentiates our program from its peers and using tools that are yet to be taught at the undergraduate level. And finally, in the role of portfolio manager, you'll see how our portfolio is constructed towards immediate growth, but also with ties to the, the idea of the preservation of wealth. We will then be shifting gears from our growth fund to our Gabelli value fund. Here, more of our passively managed fund until this semester. Our roles will be focused on our ideas of analyst. The student fund managers will be giving a brief introduction of some of our key holdings and the different techniques that we use to have the most optimal companies in our portfolio. And in addition to this, our economic assessment and sector weights will be showing a portfolio that has been constructed that many of you may want to keep in mind. Now with that being said, I would like to introduce both Josette and Jason to start the discussion of our CAFE Growth Fund. As Janetta previously mentioned, upon entering the CAFE, on one of the first days we enter, we have to conduct a thorough top-down analysis. We go no further in this program until we have a clear understanding of economic indicators on a domestic and international level. This information lets us see not only where the economies are headed, but the markets as well. Diving deeper, we decide which sectors, industries, and intern companies will benefit from the current economic and market conditions. Also, as we were starting in the summer, we see that a lot of the economic indicators pointed towards a continuation 
of the bull market that we have been experiencing over the course of the last 10 years. However, as the semester started, we noticed a few things begin to change. As the fall progressed, we noticed more concerning changes within these indicators. This is reflected in our change of stance from moderately bullish to moderately bearish. Using our top-down approach and active management style, we were able to get in front of this and see it happen before it happened in the market. On June 5th, when we started, we saw that the S&P 500, a leading indicator, reflected the strength of the economy and the market that quarter. However, as we got to September 15th or so, we began to see a change in the switch of these indicators. As the S&P started to slow in September, we saw a shift in these indices. As the Dow started to overtake the S&P, we started to watch the Dow start to consistently outperform. This reflected to us a shift in investors' value from growth to value. When you look at our uh, current weightings, or our uh, summer weightings reflected in light blue, our current weightings reflected in dark blue, and the weightings of the S&P 500, you can see how we have better positioned ourselves for the current economic and market conditions going forward. Our summer weights are reflected in how we felt in the summer on our bullish outlook. As you can see, we overweighted sectors that typically do well in times of economic expansion, such as consumer discretionary and information technology. As in the fall, we saw a bear market coming, we reverted back to market weight for these sectors. I would now like to introduce Abby and Amanda to talk about active management within our portfolio. To reinforce what was just discussed, the S&P is the leading of all leading indicators. After we saw the market pull back in February, we saw the S&P go on a long bull run until October, where the market corrected itself again as the bear took over. During this bull run, it was hard to decipher which companies were truly growth and which were value as everything was so run up. In the following slide, we'll explain to you the October correction we experienced. Every year, the student fund managers prepare for a market correction. However, this was the first semester in a long time where we had to act on our preparations. We are always warned of the October witching hour, which is when the market is, has a tendency to pull back in the month of October due to options expiring in earnings season. In September, we became very weary as we saw the more defensive sectors like consumer staples and utilities beginning to lead the market. We also saw the market to become less liquid. This is something we've been seeing since February as investors are pulling their profits out and pulling their money out. From an economic standpoint, we believe that one of the main drivers behind this market correction was the, interest, was the increase in interest rates. As the Fed increases interest rates, this causes a ripple effect through the market and individual investors. What truly differentiates the CAFE program from any other program in the country is our ability to actively manage our growth fund. As we began to see the market pull back, we decided to use our hedging techniques by using leveraged ETFs. A leveraged ETF is an exchange traded fund that mimics a market indice. This is, can be on the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, or NASDAQ. This is a bet for or against the market and can be double or triple leveraged for more gains. We bought into a two-time leveraged bull and bear ETF in order to form the Kobayashi Maru. The Kobayashi Maru is reference to the Captain Kirk saying of the no-win scenario. On October 10th, we saw the market open up with high volatility but little movement. So this is when we performed the Kobayashi Maru, putting tight trailing stops on both the bull and the bear. We used tight trailing stops, that way we'd be, we, we would be able to get out of the ETF that was not going in the direction of the market. At 2 p.m. on that day, we ended up stopping out of the bull ETF. As the market continued to go downward, we made gains and sold our bear ETF in order to get 3.5%, while our bull ETF only lost a half percent. This represented a total gain of over 3%. Although we had a total gain of 3.10% on the Kobayashi Maru, it was only 4% of our growth fund. The slide behind me will show you the transactions we made over the two days, October 10th and October 11th. This, um, is, the definition, this is the definition of active management. On the morning of the 10th, we saw the market begin to pull back, and then we saw our holdings start to stop out as well. These were mostly consumer discretionary and tech holdings. Later in the day, we decided to perform our Kobayashi Maru strategy. At around 2 o'clock, we bought into a two-time leverage bear ETF of the NASDAQ and the Dow. The following day, the S&P opened up down and the student fund managers decided to sell off the entire growth fund and buy into the short position leverage ETFs. Before market closed on the 11th, we sold off these positions. Over these two days, on October 10th, our fund lost 2.8%, and on the 11th, we lost 0.81%. However, the S&P during this time lost 5.27%. After performing the Monte Carlo simulation, we learned that if we had kept our growth funds through the October correction, we would have lost 5.4%.
However, using these leverage ETFs in the Kobayashi Maru, we saved our fund almost 2%. Now we would like to introduce Sean, Nick, and Josette to talk about the most widely used tool in active management. That would be technical analysis. With all the volatil volatility we saw during the, our time in the cafe, technical analysis was especially useful. So we were lucky to not have just one, but two opportunities to learn about this tool. The significant benefit of being involved in the cafe program is our access to the vast network of alumni. Former associate director of the cafe, Michael Simeone, came into our classroom to expand our knowledge on technical analysis, which we learned over the summer. What a lot of you may not know is that most schools don't offer a class in technical analysis. So we are incredibly blessed to not only have the class over the summer, but to also be able to sit down with a chartered market technician and expand on our knowledge of some of these metrics, such as relative strength index, candlestick charts, adjusted moving averages, consolidations and breakouts, and many more. We use these new skills to help our timing when buying and selling these equities. A perfect example of us <laughs> using this within our holdings was in the case of Domino's. <coughs> Domino's was bought into our fund last March for approximately $230 a share. Over the summer, as we did with all of our inherited holdings, we re-evaluated the company and found that it had more upside potential, so we chose to continue holding it. By September, we had made a 22% gain on the stock. Seeing such a large gain, we determined that the stock was overvalued and due for a correction. Looking at the technicals, we saw that it was on a clear uptrend, but heading towards its 50-day moving average. Looking deeper into the technicals, we also saw that its 14-day RSI was heading in overbought territory. Another technical indicator that we looked at was the MACD. This helps predict future price movements in the market. As you can see on this graph, the white MACD line crosses below the red signal line, indicating that the stock is in bearish territory. These indicators affirmed our suspicion that Domino's was heading for a correction. We chose to cut our position and immediately were kicking ourselves when over the next week we saw it jump back up. However, we trusted our analysis and didn't chase, and over the next month we saw the stock price drop 6.9%. And on November 1st, we saw the stock at a strong support level, indicating that we had to take a look back at the technicals. When we revalidated the MACD and the RSI, we saw that this stock was entering bullish territory. We were also able to purchase this stock at a 7% discount when we previously sold it. After buying back in, we have already seen a positive HPY of 1.12%. This just hammers home the point of active management. We would like to now invite up Stan, Jason, and Liam to talk about immediate growth within active management. When seeking immediate gains, our active management strategy allows us the opportunity to play earnings. One example of this is NetApp. Now imagine this. You find a company that has a strong history of beating earnings, and in the third quarter sees an earnings spike between 5 and 16%. So you decide to play earnings. You buy in, and after hours, the stock falls more than 10%. Now, 10% 10 overnight, overnight loss might seem like a lot, but trust me, you don't have to feel bad for us about it. Another example of a company we played earnings on was Salesforce. As they reported earnings after hours on November 27th, we saw a price jump of over 10%. Also, as we have continued to hold Salesforce in our growth fund, we have consistently seen it outperform <coughs> its sector. Now that we showed you how we make money in the short term, Adam, Nick, and Sean will discuss how we preserve our wealth. As he just touched upon, one of the main goals in our growth fund is the preservation of wealth. One of the ways we do this is through making sure our portfolio is well diversified. Behind me is a tool we use to achieve this goal called the correlation matrix. On the left you can see our summer correlation and on the right you can see our fall correlation. The red indicates that we pick stocks that moved with each other. This is great on an update in the market, but however, when the market is down, our portfolio got killed. But after reallocating in the fall, we chose stocks that moved negatively with each other, meaning they move in the opposite direction. This helps hedge against systematic risk. Also, our growth fund is now shifting more towards a blend objective in 2019. A perfect example of the importance of diversification was with NextEra Energy. This was the only company we chose to hold in our growth fund through the October correction after we sold the entire rest of the fund. We made this decision based on the assumption that utilities would be running on a down day in the market. As you can see, when we went to cash on October 11th, when we bought in October 31st, we, the market lost 0.61% during this time. In this time frame, you can see the utility sector ETF gaining 1.28%. Meanwhile, our holding of NAE outperformed them both, returning over 2%. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is preserving wealth. Now, we would like to show you how this active management has helped our performance. But let's remember, not only have we had this semester to perform our different techniques in managing our growth fund, but two different holding periods, both the summer and the fall. Therefore, we will be reporting that whole performance the same way. In the summer performance, our growth fund outperformed the S&P by 1% on a raw return basis. You can see that we outperform while taking on the same risk of the market. Like industry, we try to focus on risk-adjusted performance. This is represented here by alpha. As you can see, our alpha is 1.59%, 
showing that we outperformed on a risk-adjusted basis by that amount during this time period. However, growth in the fall was a bit of a different story, considering that we were moving from a bullish market to a more bearish market. Thank goodness we actually managed our fund as we reallocated our weights into October 31st. On the graph behind me, you can see that our growth fund was able to outperform most of our competitors on a raw basis. But unfortunately, on a risk-adjusted basis, we did underperform the market with an alpha of 0.28%. Now it is time to show you the optimal portfolio. As you can see here, over the summer, the value fund outperformed on a raw adjusted basis and a risk adjusted basis, represented by the alpha of 1.013%. <coughs> now moving into the fall, we actually had a negative return, but we lost less than the market. This is reflected by our increase in alpha to 1.42%. Now, again, let's look at our holding period between June 5th to December 4th. Our value fund continued to outperform all of our competitors on a raw basis. And therefore, the S&P was also beat, with our risk-adjusted performance to be 2.72%. Now obviously, since growth and value are two totally different objectives, our weights <coughs> in these funds are going to be different as well. And since we changed our outlook from the summer to the fall, we have all those weightings up here for you. The light blue represents our weights in the summer in our value fund, the dark blue are weights now, and the gray are the current S&P weights. You can see that we reduced our weight in the technology sector <coughs> due to the fact that we saw the, the rapid rise of the average PE in that sector and we deemed it overvalued. On the other hand, we increased the weight in the utility sector because we saw it as a hedge against the day in the down market. Another sector we changed our outlook on was consumer discretionary. We were originally overweight in the summer and we brought this down to market weight in the fall based on our bearish outlook on the retail industry, which is such a large part of the sector. We'd now like to talk a little about, a bit about the individual holdings within our sectors in the value fund. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before we talk about our holdings, let's talk about our strategy. When establishing our fund, we set out to follow the principles of value investing. With this, we set a three to five year time horizon. We stress the importance of looking at the fundamentals as we thought it was more important to buy the stock, the company, and not the stock. We had a great example with our holding JP Morgan as we uh, due to our holding J.P. Morgan as CEO Jamie Dimon's great leadership abilities and well-experienced board directors. Yeah. Other than being extremely good looking, one thing that we love about Jamie Dimon is his ability to go against the herd. This is important in life as well as it is in value investing. Herding is referred to as short-term movements that are based on things like behavioral news in the market and we don't pay attention to this with a long-term outlook kept in mind. We rather focus on what the company is doing on the inside and where their outlook going forward will project them. We'd now like to bring up Nick, Josette, and Sean to talk about consumer discretionary and consumer staples. As Nick mentioned before, a sector that we saw a large shift in from summer to fall was consumer discretionary. While we watched one of our holdings, Lululemon, rally throughout the summer almost 28%, while this was fun, we saw a huge shift in the fall. As we started to see them consistently underperform, we knew we had to cut our position and move towards safer holdings. Well, it was great watching Lululemon rise in the summer. They did fall in the, in the fall. McDonald's during this time frame gained almost 13% during this time. This shows a shift more towards value companies rather than growth <laughs> companies, and even a contraction in the business cycle. Two companies that we felt fit this objective were Garmin and McDonald's. Now when a lot of people hear Garmin, they think about GPS devices. And while they still make this, they've actually expanded their business model a lot. A large focus is now on fitness watches, and their watches are actually considered the professional product in that market. They also have marine aviation and outdoor segments. These diversified revenue streams lead us to believe that they will be able to avoid cyclical risk. On top of that, they pay a high dividend and push a premium project, as I mentioned, with a customer base that's willing to pay up even in a down economy. McDonald's also protects us from systematic risk using their cheap products. As consumer sentiment decreases, the amount of disposable income people have to spend decreases with it. This pushes consumer towards cheaper things like McDonald's. Our confidence in these holdings is reflected in our decision to market weight this rather than underweight it in our value fund. What initially drew us to McDonald's was the fact that it was beaten up. This caused the potential for a high upside ratio. During this time, we saw the stock in the consolidation zone while their operating cash flows were increasing quarter over quarter with a consistent stagnant stagnant. Because of this, we knew the stock was due for a breakout. When we saw them hit their floor in September, we knew it was time to buy in. After watching them rise almost 14%, we knew we were correct in our analysis. As Josette previously mentioned, the main thing that drew us to McDonald's was our outlook that they would be able to perform in a down economy. 
However, we also have a very positive outlook on their ability to expand and improve on their business model moving into the future. For example, the, co the company is now improving their technology advances by using these self-ordering kiosks. Customers can skip the line and use these digital platforms or the McDonald's application. They've also partnered up with Uber Eats to be able to deliver food to your doorstep. Considering that there's a McDonald's in almost every town in America, it makes sense they would have a much larger market share than their competitors. This to us reflects their focus on consumer loyalty and brand recognition. We would now like to talk a little bit about the consumer staples sector. Looking at Stovall's sector rotation, we could very well be entering an early contractionary period. This tells us that investors are going to start moving their money to things like utilities and, of course, consumer staples. Historically, consumer staples has done very well during this time. After all, everyone is going to need the necessities that Procter & Gamble provides, such as paper towel towels, tissues, dish detergent, laundry detergent, toothpaste. I mean, Mom, I hope you brushed your teeth this morning. <laughs> While we may not see something as drastic as a market crash or a recession, we do expect to see some sort of economic slowdown going into 2019. Because of this, we decided to focus on holdings that we thought would perform well under these conditions. He already mentioned Procter & Gamble. The other company that we felt fit this objective was Costco. As many of you already may know, the market took a big hit on Tuesday, with the S&P and Dow both down 3%, indicated by this red line. Our value holding, Procter & Gamble, stayed flat during this time frame, only losing one bit. One of the things we look at, especially with value investing, is institutional holdings. Behind me is Vanguard, a very credible institution, and this chart shows that they've been increasing their position in Costco year over year for some time. We'd like to specify that this does not mean we're following the herd, rather it's one of many metrics we look at that supports our outlook on this company. We also see that Costco's short ratio is decreasing year over year. This just tells us that less investors are shorting the stock and more investors have confidence in this company. We'd now like to invite up Adam and Liam to talk about the industrial sector. So we decided to overweight the industrial sector because we have noticed a shift to more defensive sectors. Currently in our value fund, we hold three, count them, three companies, John Dynamics, Waste Management, and Ingersoll Rand. We chose these companies because we have a bullish outlook on the industrial sector moving into 2019. The first reason would be the defense budget. 2019 is expected to have the largest U.S. defense budget at over $950 billion. John Dynamics is a government contractor, so they would serve well in this. A lot of corporations are working to reduce their carbon footprint. All three of our holdings are actively working to make their products and services more efficient. This not only improves public perception of the company, but creates a far superior product, and companies that don't do this will be left behind. Finally, trade and tariffs remain a headwind for this industry. However, with the majority of revenue for these three companies coming from the United States, we're able to limit the downside to tariff uncertainty. We have a 3% holding of General Dynamics in our fund, and we absolutely love this company. Here's a few reasons why. First, they have a strong board of directors that's comp comprised of retired generals and army commanders. They also have a former senior vice president of the Boeing Company, one of their competitors. General Dynamics also succeeds through mergers and acquisition. Their acquisition of CSRA allows them to enhance their technological capabilities, and their acquisition of FWW allows them to enhance their services worldwide. Finally, their diverse revenue streams allows them not to be overexposed in one segment of their business. They also continue to innovate and, gen and generate continuous revenues from these streams by updating to market trends. But some of you may think that because General Dynamics has outperformed the industry in the past month that this is the end. Well, you're wrong. General Dynamics has an average price target of over $220. This is an upside of over 26% to this aerospace and defense pioneer. Now I'd like to bring up Stan, Trillo, and Matt to discuss financials. We are bullish on the financial sector as we decide to overweight it in our value fund. Our four holdings included Chubb, Raymond James, J.P. Morgan, Discover Financial Services. One of the biggest drivers for the financial sector is and will be interest rates. Despite the Fed expecting to slow down future rate hikes, any additional rate hikes would help boost margins in an already profitable sector. Another driver is regulations. Under the current administration, we've seen a rollback in regulations such as Dodd-Frank. Even if this rollback does not continue moving forward, we're currently in a more regulatory-friendly environment than we were before. Also, when we look back to the theory of sector rotation that was previously mentioned, we said that we were currently experiencing a contraction. Financials generally benefits uh, towards the end of a contraction, so we are comfortable with our long-term outlook of being bullish on the sector. The first of two holdings we'd like to present to you is Chubb Limited. The thing that stood out to us about this company is that they're the world leader in providing insurance. Chubb displayed great fundamental fundamentals compared to its competition. It had a lower price to book, lower peg ratio, and better margins than its competitors. This made us believe the stock was undervalued and at its current price. 
In addition to its undervaluation, we also love the fact that Chubb has been able to consistently increase their dividend over the time frame of 25 years. Chubb was also well diversified through their geographic and product segments around the world. We really emphasize the diversification in our value fund as it helps companies hedge against risk. This is very important for Chubb who deals with property and casualty insurance as natural disasters happen all the time and in very concentrated areas. Chubb operates in four main geographic segments, North America, Latin America, Asia, and Europe. By operating in these four segments, it allows them to diversify away from the risk that any one market poses. In addition to Chubb's global diversification, their product segments were well diversified as most of their revenue came from North America Commercial Personal PNC. The next holding we'd like to present is Discover Financial Services. Despite the beating it took Tuesday, we're very confident in this holding moving forward. Discover has crazy swings as it has a higher standard deviation and higher beta. To re-emphasize our value outlook, we would like to look towards things not like Discover's pr uh, price drop on Tuesday, but rather things like the fact that their year-over-year -year er, revenues have been steadily increasing at an increasing rate since 2011. Also, when we look to a chart reflecting our projected time holding period of around two to five, or three to five years, we can see that since this company bottomed in 2016, they've moved within a steady trend channel upward. They are currently lying on the bottom of this trend channel again and around their 52 week low, and we anticipate this company to recover strong as it has done in the past. Looking at some key fundamentals, we can see that Discover trades at a low price relative to its earnings. It has a current PE of under eight and boasts the best EBITDA margins in its industry. Discover credit card sales have increased 4% each of the last few years, as well as their volume increasing 12% year over year. Another one of the benefits of being in the CAFE program is our access to the resources that we do have. When looking at things like ValueLine.com and Zach's investment research, we can see that other analysts can reaffirm our confidence in Discover as a value holding. But wait, we hold both Discover and Visa in our value fund. Don't they do the same thing? They're actually very different, and I'll tell you why. Discover holds consumer debt while, and offers additional loan services, while Visa is a third party that processes payments. This is why we classify Discover as a financial company and Visa as a technology company. So why do we hold Visa? After running a correlation with Discover and Visa, we found that neither of these credit card companies move together at all. <laughs> Considering that they're both very strong holdings and good at what they do, we see them both as optimal fits for our value fund. Well, does every Visa card come with a picture of Doc on it? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I'd now like to welcome a man to help me discuss the technology sector. Moving into a riskier sector, we'd like to talk to you about tech, which has taken us on a very wild ride this semester. <laughs> Within this volatile sector, we wanted to find value-like companies that we would feel comfortable holding over the next three to five years in our portfolio in case of an uncertain market. We feel we have four holdings well-equipped to navigate current market conditions. These include Microsoft, Cognizant, Visa, and Cisco. Moving forward in the tech sector, we decided to underweight it in value due to its volatility. However, we see continued strong growth and we think prices have come down since the October correction. Microsoft is one of our top tech holdings. This is due to their diversified product mix as well as their leadership in their cloud computing platform. Recently they switched over to more subscription-based sales. This has allowed their revenue to become more stable and more recurring. As you can see over the last few years, Microsoft has a steady increase in their revenue. In 2014, Microsoft decided to change its business model from a more hardware so focus to a more software focus, including their cloud computing and their more personal computing. If you look at their operating cash flows, so you can see that in 2014, it changed from a more cyclical cycle to a more constant growth year over year. Our three to five year outlook on Microsoft is very strong due to our expectations for them to continue leading in their cloud platform, as well as continue, uh, and continue stable with their growth segments, such as continue growth on their stable segments, such as Office 365 and their game computing. Another thing we love about Microsoft moving forward is their leadership. Just as we discussed before with Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan, Satya Nadella has totally transformed the company. Moving them from hardware to software and transferring over to subscription-based sales, we see the company entering a long-term uptrend. Another holding we'd like to briefly touch upon is Cognizant. Cognizant is basically the IT people for corporate clients. Behind me, you can see a graph of Cognizant's last eight earnings reports of where they beat each time. In fact, they haven't missed a single earnings since 2008, which is pretty impressive. An emphasis on earnings is something we place in our, with our value holdings, as this allows them to navigate a volatile time. Next, I would like to introduce Abby to come and talk to me about, with me about healthcare. On the other hand, healthcare is a much safer sector that we've decided to overweight. We have four holdings, which include Medtronic, Johnson & Johnson, United Health Group, and Quest Diagnostics. Although three of these holdings do fall under the same main industry, they all do very different things. Medtronic is a medical device and equipment company. 
where Johnson & Johnson, who also has a medical device segment, has two other segments in pharma and personal products. Then we also hold UNH, which is basically the largest provider of health insurance in the sector, as well as Quest, who is a lab diagnostic lab testing company outside of the hospital realm. We are bullish on the sector for three reasons. The first one being that the healthcare sector has, ex has historically outperformed other sector in times of higher interest rates. Also, previously mentioned, we believe that we are heading into a more of a contractionary period, and this is where we see investors flee to the sector for safety. We are also seeing that the baby boomer, boomer generation is aging. Therefore, we might see an increased demand in healthcare as these patients will need care. Medtronic is one of our largest holdings and best holdings in the healthcare sector due to their diversified revenue segments and strong fundamentals. Two of their largest segments are cardiology and surgical solutions. Medtronic is also working on the advancement of their technologies and global outreach to aid countries such as China and India with underdeveloped healthcare systems. Behind me, you can see how Medtronic outperforms its two competitors, Boston Scientific and Abbott, on every fundamental basis. When looking at their price to earnings ratio, you can see that Medtronic significantly, significantly outperforms their two competitors. You can see that for every $25 you invest, you'll get $1 back in earnings. However, for the other two companies, you'd have to invest $36 or $39 to get that same dollar in return. This is expected to decrease in the future. Besides being a great value, Medtronic is also more liquid, less leverage, and more profitable than Boston Scientific and Abbott. As well, you can see that their beta and standard deviation are significantly lower than their two competitors. This means that they're taking on less total risk and also less company-specific risk, which is beneficial in an uncertain market. Our three to five year outlook for Medtronic remains strong due to their acquisition of Mazer Technologies and their Global Excellence Program, which is looking to expand their sites worldwide. Along with this, they are also trying to cut costs by improving their supply chain infrastructure to increase margins. Another holding we like to briefly touch upon is Johnson & Johnson, due to their tendencies to outperform in a down market. What keeps, this sec what keeps this company afloat on down days are its personal care staple products that we all use, like Benadryl, Band-Aid, and Neutrogena. As you can see, on Tuesday, when the market was down over 3%, Johnson & Johnson was barely negative, losing only 12 bips. This means that it proves that it's stable in this kind of market. Next, we would like to introduce Adam and Liam to talk about materials. Air Products and Chemicals is our only materials holding, and so far it has made us more than 7%. Due to positive guidance on this sector, we've decided to overweight it for a few reasons. The first reason being global trade and tariffs. Global trade and tariffs can swing this sector in either direction. However, APD is positioned with 55% of its business coming from North America. The other large segment stems from Europe, thus limiting global exposure. We've also seen an increase in demand in Latin America. Air Products and Chemicals has began to capitalize on this, by taking a 67% acquisition stake in a Chilean industrial gas company. Finally, in recent news, we've all seen large fluctuations in commodities such as liquid natural gas and crude oil. APD has minimal exposure to liquid natural gas, so they will not be as affected to the price changes as their competitors who have larger stakes in this commodity. As you can see, Air Products and Chemicals has begun to increase their gross profit margin year over year. They do this in a couple of ways. First, they've removed their materials technology segment from their business so they have more money to focus on their already profitable industrial gases segment. Also, they're in the middle of a $600 million cost savings effort. They work with this in order to become the most diverse and the most efficient uh, materials company in the whole sector. When you look at their competitor, Dow DuPont, they have decreasing gross profit margins year over year. Now, Abby and Josette will discuss the new communication services sector. On September 28th, the SMB created a new sector, communication services. This took the old telecom sector and brought in companies from consumer discretionary and technology. Although we expected some volatility in news about this new sector, we actually didn't hear much. The next slide will introduce you to our communication services holdings. Our two holdings are AT&T and Disney. AT&T falls under the telecom industry, while Disney's in media and entertainment. We remain, we remain bearish on the sector for three reasons. We are bearish on this sector because of the high expenses, high competition, and a already highly saturated market. Because of this, we see less growth for this sector in the future. We fell in love with Disney as they're expanding their film and entertainment segments with new movies such as Incredibles 2 and the Star Wars series. Disney's also able to build their media empire using Fox 21st century assets with their new streaming service, Disney Plus. 
With the expansion of their parks and resorts through higher ticket prices and global expansion, and their ESPN Plus reaching over 1 million subscribers since April, and the newly acquired UFC writes, we believe that this will drive Disney in the future. Although we are bearish on this sector as a whole, we have faith in our holding Disney. Their large cash outflows for investing activities will support their parks and new streaming service, Disney Plus. Because of it, this, we have faith in Disney's future earnings. We would now like to introduce, introduce you to the energy sector analysts. When looking at the energy sector, you can see that we are slightly overweight. However, this isn't due to a bullish outlook on the sector, rather because we have extreme confidence in our two holdings of Simerix Energy Co. and ConocoPhillips. We were impressed by their cash flows as, long as, as well as their fundamentals such as their current and quick ratio, turnover ratio, and cash flow margins. The main driver in the energy sector is crude oil prices. While this was our best friend over the first half of the semester, it ended up being our worst enemy. However, we're, we're determined not to let day-to-day -day or even month-to-month -month price movements affect our decisions. The energy sector is heavily influenced by international relations as oil is a globally traded commodity with suppliers in unstable parts of the world. Another factor is a shift towards clean energy, but we believe it will be a long time before the world shifts away from oil. Looking into Simerex Energy Co., they are a company that deals with oil and gas exploration and production within the United States. We all share an interesting bond around this company as over the summer it was the first thing that we decided to sell as a group together. However, when reallocating our value fund, we stumbled across this company again, arguably a bit more educated. The first thing we looked at this time was the increase in operating cash flows year over year in each of the four quarters. Etsy City saw a severe price drop with no justification. This is when we decided to buy in on them. We caught this company right at its bottom, and after smashing earnings, we saw the price jump over 12%. While this was a fun ride, we did not buy Simerax for this. We bought this with a three to five year outlook, and we can justify this through their strong earnings guidance and price targets. When seeing that their earnings increased strongly year over year, and looking at some of their recent price targets of $144 and $137 per share, with a 12-month price target average of around $123, we can see that we're positioned for around a 50% return if we continue to hold Simerex. XCC's commitment to increase their dividend was attractive to shareholders as they were already above the industry's average. With forecasting production output expected to increase, we expected their in revenue increase as well. Additionally, they have a break-even point at $30 a barrel, and we feel this gives us a comfortable margin to help protect against the volatility in oil prices. This, combined with the fundamentals, is the reason why we are bullish on the company moving forward. Now Sean and Nick will talk to you about utilities. As we touched upon before, we see the utility sector as a good flight to safety during times of uncertainty. Because of this, we have chosen to overweight it by approximately 2% in our value fund. If you direct your attention to this chart behind me, you can see that over the past three months, the tech and consumer discretionary spider ETFs have lost money, while the utilities ETF has returned over 4%. Although this is a small proportion in our value fund, during the month of October, these were the only holdings that we held. This worked out well for us as ETR, the electrical utilities company, gained 3.4% during this time. Going back to Tuesday, when the S&P and the Dow entered back into a correctionary period, both losing over 3%, you can see that ETI returned a whopping 1.33%, outperforming the market and successfully preserving our investors' wealth. This hammers home that utilities is a good sector to hold during times of high volatility. Now traditionally, this would be the time that the student fund managers would reflect back on the lessons that they have learned through their time in the CAFE program. But we hope that we have emphasized how awesome it's been to be able to be in this program for the longer time period, experiencing both a bullish and semi-bearish market. Now, the, ca the purpose of the CAFE program is truly to ex uh, experience a real-world industry that mimics industry in every single way possible. For examples, the responsibility and pressure of managing running real-time. Long hours making us successful student fund managers. Our professionalism, not just suiting up but answering to a boss or bosses. In-depth financial reporting. And of course, being able to conduct business across the globe. Which we were able to do with Tokyo, thanks to the support of Hans Christensen at MJX Asset Management. And lastly, learning how to work in an environment with the absolute highest of expectations. And with that, we are concluding our presentation for this fall and opening up the floor to any questions. Yeah, so during the market correction, we use leverage ETFs. 
Um, we were, we, it took us some time to decide what we wanted to do during, when, if we were to experience a market correction, whether we wanted to go to cash or we wanted to hold onto our growth fund and just take the beating. So as a group, we decided to use leverage ETFs. Um, everyone was doing it during the, during the market correction. Uh, the market was going down and we decided to play the market and really regain our alpha that we lost in, in the spring. Yeah, like Abby was saying, we want to gain alpha back as most people were in cash and we want to do an active management pro approach by buying these bear ETFs. So uh, to add on that, so you day traded both the, uh, the, the short, short leverage ETF and the long leverage ETF. Yeah, so, that, yep, so we, we did that. We, that's called the Kobayashi Maru. So we weren't sure which way the market was going to go. So instead of just losing money, we, we used both the bear and bull. That way, whatever direction the market went in, we would make money on that side and stop out of the ETF that wasn't in the direction of the market. So I have a question from Mr. Jason Morton, who's part of the advisory board, he texted it in to me, watched it live. And um, his question is how um, and why you determine your benchmark as the S&P 500 for the growth portfolio instead of an index that has a growth objective? So during the semester, we actually had like different discussions with this entire idea of always using the S&P as our benchmark. Um, and we did discuss the idea of having this blended benchmark using ETFs in relation to the weights that we were putting on the sectors. We did use those as comparisons for a lot of the times that we saw the market being pulled down or maybe when we were underperforming both the S&P or the Dow and we were a bit uncertain about our portfolios and it just led us to confirm that even though we might have these weights and they might be different from the um, S&P, we were still performing the way that we should be. You mentioned Tuesday a number of times. So you talk about what caused the market to fall on Tuesday and how it insulated the portfolio and why the portfolio is insulated now from any potential flare-ups in the future. Okay. So, so October is generally a volatile time of the year. We've seen a lot of market corrections and crashes start in the month of October. Um, moving forward, our value fund has a very low beta. We've overweighted sectors like consumer staples. Uh, moving forward, if the market were to continue to fall down, we're very well equipped to produce positive alpha in that time. Yeah, I was just gonna go based on what he said. We reallocate our weights around the end of October, so we were prepared for this economy to slow down, so Tuesday wasn't a shock to us. And we do think that Tuesday was a bit of a rebound from the behavioral news where we saw the S&P rally earlier, in, like last week or so. I have another question from Ms. Molly Patron, who is um, was also part of the CAFE program. Uh, she asks, uh, how do you think the utilities will fare in this increasing interest rate market? Well, I don't know about the entire sector, but we think that our holdings will do pretty well. Um, and just, I mean, going back to the entire sector, it's, as we saw throughout October, we were looking at it a lot, and a lot of times when everything's down, people are throwing money into utilities. We went for electric over like water or oil because it's supposed to be not that cold for winter and we don't think people are gonna need heating as much. So we tried to pick the industry that we think is the safest. Um, we don't really think it's gonna be affected by interest rates nearly as much as something like financials or the other sectors. So we think it's a lot, it's a really good hedge in times of uncertainty. And as many of you probably know, utilities is a heavily subsidized um, sector. So the government's not gonna let a lot of these companies fall too far. The word you use once or twice that uh, come on my mind a lot these days, tariffs, uh, trade. And I'm just curious, maybe I'm because of the comments, I just dwell too much on it, but the, the, how did all the you know, movement toward trade wars and, and uncertainty, how did that impact, just reflections on how that impacted your discussions about the portfolio? Well, so one thing to keep in mind about tariffs and trade is we've had that for years and years. It's not something that's new. We have a president now that just likes to talk about it a lot more and get everyone wild up about it when he's talking about China and other different nations. Um, but especially with our value portfolio, we need to keep in mind that you know these are only short-term uh, news snippets that are coming out that cause people to really move. Uh, and a lot of our positions are, or a lot of our holdings are positioned well to you know negate any of the tariff risks that we might see in the future. Yeah, I mean, in the next couple of years, we don't really know what's going to happen to tariffs, so we don't feel that there's any sense in speculating on it. 
Our value fund has a three to five year outlook. So it's anyone's guess where tariffs go, but we're properly diversified away so that we're not overly exposed to it. I have a question from Ms. Carla Puccini on the advisory board. Um, she asks, given the market condition over the past two months, what part of the daily active management did you find most challenging? I think it would be technical analysis because we are one of the groups that use technical analysis the most out of any cafe group probably besides like around 2008 because when that correction was going on we had to find support lines and resistance lines in order to know when to buy back in the right uh, buy back in the right opportunity there. I would say like also ignoring behavioral news like for our value fund we have a three to five year outlook so seeing things change and react to the news every day it's sometimes hard to stick to our objective and remember that we're not we're not listening to other people's opinions when we have a three to five year outlook. Were there any points in time during discussions within the cafe where you know you're about fifty fifty split and how did you get through that? Yeah absolutely um it actually happened a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we had a lot of people coming in who were kind of bearish in the beginning, a lot of people who were bullish. So usually when that would happen, it wasn't easy to get over. We'd end up staying a lot later than we wanted to because people wouldn't give up their opinion. But we would just go back to the economic indicators and pretty much just argue your point. Go do more research, bring up as much like, like due diligence, obviously, like leave no stone unturned. I know we use like chaos theory at one point and everything. So it's pretty much just swaying the other side until we... So someone gave it. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> remember Cape first. Everyone right? has a price. Yeah. Guys, great, great presentation. Um, you know, you certainly, I'm sure you learned a lot this semester uh, with recent volatility. As, as we're now in year 10 of a bull market, um, take me through why you, both of these funds are still 100% invested in the market and you haven't fleet the cash for cash alternatives. So we did like, originally flee to cash, which is why we did do the leverage ETF and perform the Kobayashi Maru. But after we saw the market start to cool off, we kind of thought we wanted to position our portfolios in a way that we could hold our funds in equities as the market continued or if there was a potential decrease in the market. So that's why we have positioned our value, value fund the way it is. And we have been comfortable on these down days over the past few weeks that it has been performing well and outperforming the market. And then with our growth fund, because that's more actively managed, we are that's just something we have to continuously look at and choose every day, every week, every month, like if we want to continue holding what we have, if we want to change it up a bit. So that's basically how we went through this semester and how we hope the portfolios will continue to be. Yeah, just speaking to our value fund too, is we overweighted um, utilities, staples, and financials as we follow the sector rotation, and we feel this uh, the value fund is well positioned in the next three to five year time frame. So. You obviously have a state of the art facility in the cafe. I'm wondering if there's one tool, and you, you, there, there will be differing opinions. Is there one tool that you feel stood out the most as being most helpful to you, especially during the volatility period? Definitely uh, the technical analysis, which we talked about when Michael Simeone came in. As they also mentioned, we took the class beforehand in order to better learn about it. And when he came in, we just like saw how cool it was. So we thought that it was something that we wanted to implement more. And then when the market was going down, like this was a perfect time for us to use the technical analysis to see when we wanted to exactly time our buyings, like when we wanted to buy into the leveraged ETFs when we wanted to trade out. like, And same with our growth fund, that's how we're gonna be able to continue forward with that fund too. As far as the best like technological tool, we love using te technical analysis on Bloomberg. Um, it has all the annotations. You can pretty much mark up the chart however you want. And uh, that's definitely one of the ways that we navigated through the uh, correction. Uh, would you guys have favorite company heading into 2019 and any of your current holdings not pass the sleep test? No, none of them. We have confidence in all of our holdings. Uh, great. I can't speak on everyone else's favorite company. I really like Entergy, but I think it's really because we're all different sector analysts. Uh, it's kind of... What would the trend, what, what would be your, if you had one company to invest McDonald's. Probably McDonald's, yeah. McDonald's. Every yeah. single company is my favorite company. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I think McDonald's. 
It's, it, McDonald's has not only already performed so well for us, but its outlook into 2019 is, is just great as well. Not to mention how safe that was. This question is from myself. So I noticed that both funds are completely 100% domestic. Um, and with Brian mentioning this is our 10th year of a bull market, um, is there any discussion about potentially going into a global or even including just some international funds? I think next semester, um, after being all domestic this semester, they're looking more towards global markets. After we did our top-down analysis, we didn't think it was profitable to go into the foreign markets, but I think that's going to change um, in January. Yeah. We've also seen a lot of the foreign markets kind of suffering from the same things that we are right now in terms of like behavioral news and what's dragging it down and slowing economies. <laughs> so we didn't really see an advantage when looking into foreign markets in the first place. It was also harder to find some of the information on companies within foreign markets, but I mean, that's another that's story. That's what you know, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, before we all join together in giving these very talented and hardworking students a big hand for all of their work in the summer and now, I'd like to extend one more special or a set of special thank yous to people, to people who are not here with us today. Um, Hans Christensen has already been mentioned of MJX Securities. He has been a great supporter of the CAFE program for a number of years and has made possible the international travel that is such a unique characteristic of this program. And I'd also like to thank Mario Gabelli, um, who has been a longtime supporter, of course, of our school and certainly of the CAFE program um, and helping out uh, along the way with lots of different things that um, have been seen and unseen. So I'd like to thank both of them, even though they're not here. They may be watching. If they are, hello and thanks to both of you. And uh, please join me in giving a big hand to these great students. stock market, betas, or any of those kinds of things, or even if you just want to stay and visit for a while, uh, we do have a lovely reception set up in the Bayview room of the law school, which is just across the uh, corridor here, the little open <coughs> space, and especially for all of you parents who are here who are also very, very welcome, and we're so glad so many of you could be with us. We'd love for you to stay and, and join in a conversation, and everybody is welcome, so please join us. Uh, it will be open for the next hour or so. We'd love to see all of you there. And last but not least, happy holidays to everyone, and good luck on exams. Yeah. <laughs>